Thank you. My name is Marlene Estman, and thank you very much for having me speak here today. I work with project development in the energy sector. And in the past few years, I've been working more and more with hybrid power projects. With hybrids, I mean power plants that combine different technologies in the same project, such as renewables together with engines, for example. I have also been working more and more with battery energy storage. Renewables and energy storage, besides changing my job and making it more complex, but also much more interesting, they're also transforming the energy and electricity sector uh, in the world. And that is the topic of my talk here today. The energy transition and how we should approach it for a better and a more sustainable future. Energy and electricity are in many ways the lifeblood of our modern societies. There's very few things in the world which would function as they do now without them. People need access to electricity, they need affordable electricity, and they, we, also urgently need clean electricity. I think we're all aware of climate change and global warming. Carbon dioxide, rising sea levels, melting glaciers, dying polar bears, extreme weather events, wildfires, coral bleaching. I could go on, but I, I don't want to. And this was known and predicted first by scientists 40 years ago. Scientists on the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, IPCC, estimate that about 25% of current greenhouse gas emissions come from electricity and heat production. And a further 14% comes from transportation. There's much to do in the energy sector. And it's clear that a global energy transition is a must. But before I continue on the topic of the energy transition, uh, I would like to share a story with you. I live and work here in Singapore with my husband, but I'm originally from Finland. And most of my family and friends are, are living in Finland um, and Europe. And because I miss them and I want to see them, I've of course also invited them to come and visit us here in Singapore which for most people with normal jobs means taking a long flight. Not the most climate friendly thing to do. I recently had a conversation with two of my good friends around this topic. One friend, though she really wanted to come and see us, felt that for her personally, it's an important moral choice to abstain from flying. It's possible to climate compensate, but she felt that it's not good enough. My other friend also cares deeply about climate change and has for years. She responded that she is losing hope that anything we do will be able to save the planet anymore, or humanity at any rate. So if we're all doomed anyway, is there anything wrong, really, with prioritizing friendship? I understand and respect the point of view of both my friends. I think it's inspiring and, and admirable to make lifestyle changes or sacrifices based on ethical considerations. I also think that, that each and every one of us should look in the mirror and ask ourselves what, what we can do at a personal level. Climate change and, and our way of life is, in my opinion, the largest ethical conundrum of our time. 
far beyond issues such as driverless car safety or, or privacy concerns. On an intellectual level, I agree with my other friend. Time is running out so fast and the proportions are so vast. What can we do? But though it may seem like despair to some or like cynicism to others, I believe that there's a value in facing the facts. We are not currently on track towards an acceptable outcome. I am, however, what someone might refer to as a naive optimist. So I responded to my friends that the only way I believe that we can save the planet is if we get the systems and the economics to drive development in the same direction as the environmental needs. And I have hope because I work in an industry where change has already happened so much faster than anybody thought it would. And there is further potential for revolutionary change and decarbonization in the energy sector. So, to return to the topic of the energy transition, coal, oil and gas amount to about 80% of our total primary energy consumption in the world today. That's electricity, heat, transport, everything. If we look just at electricity generation, about 65% comes from fossil fuel based generation. Most of the rest comes from nuclear and hydro. And wind and solar together today make up less than 10% of electricity generation. This doesn't sound that exciting. You know, what's, what's this big change that we're hearing about? Well, the change becomes apparent if we look at the cost trends of renewables. The decline in cost for particularly wind and solar has been tremendous. Since 2010, for example, solar and battery energy storage has dropped in cost by 85% and wind by 49%. Wind and solar are now the cheapest form of new power across more than two thirds of the world. And by 2030, new build wind and solar will be cheaper than existing coal and gas generation almost everywhere. We are at the stage where renewables from both an environmental and an economic perspective should form the baseload of our electricity generation. They should generate the majority of the electricity that we use. But we all know that renewables are intermittent. The sun only shines during the day and wind is also variable. And when you start to have more renewables in your systems, the variations will also be higher. If we have an open spot market, for example, during times when there's a lot of solar and wind production, the prices may even go negative. And conversely, during times when you have low renewable production and high demand, prices can rise very high. So though the average cost will come down, the variability will increase. Even for countries that don't have a spot market, one needs to balance the demand and the supply of electricity at all times, in real time. This means that the other forms of generation on our electricity grids will need to be very flexible to balance the intermittency of renewables. However, a lot of our existing generation like coal and large combined cycle gas turbine power plants are designed 
to operate at a flat load and high capacity. They don't like to start and stop. They don't like to ramp up and down to follow the output of renewables. It increases their costs. They consume more fuel, it shortens their lifetime, and often they simply cannot do it. They're not flexible enough. Luckily, there is a range of flexible technologies which can increase the amount of renewables we have in our systems, increase our penetration of, of renewables. These are technologies like engine technology, battery energy storage, interconnectivity of grids, and solutions like demand-side management, demand response, virtual power plants. Flexibility will need to increase. And we have all technologies available today to make the energy transition happen. So if we invest more into renewables and electricity, we'll not only be able to decarbonize our grids, we'll also be able to lower costs. Wind and solar together are projected to make up 50% of global generation by 2050. And that is at a global level. Certain individual countries will move much faster in increasing their amount of renewables. And hopefully the overall pace of change can also be even quicker. But so far, I've talked mostly about electricity generation. What about heat and transport? There is an enormous potential for efficiency improvement and emission savings by electrifying heat and transport. Of course, that only works if we have clean electricity. But as we start to have more renewables and we start to have excess renewable capacity in our energy systems, we can also use that clean electricity to create green hydrogen. Hydrogen can be a form of storage, or it can be further combined uh, to make synthetic, non-fossil fuels. Again, I would like to repeat, we have all the technologies already today to make the energy transition happen. But it won't happen by itself. Even though this makes economic sense, it's a massive transformation. There's inertia, there's vested interests, sometimes politics, and legitimate concerns for the reliability of power. I also don't believe that there is a silver bullet solution. This is a complex topic. And there will be a need for multiple solutions and technologies in the future. And I know that I have only highlighted some of them here today. So how should we approach the energy transition? Well, I want to return to the conversation between me and my, my two friends. And I believe that we should approach it with a mix with scientific rigor and the intellectual bravery to look at cold, hard, uncomfortable facts, with moral responsibility, and with enough optimism to keep believing in and pushing for the solutions. Thank you.